Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. My name is Steve Day. Um, I'm the care pastor over at Calvary, and I have the privilege of introducing this man. And uh, he, he comes to tell us his story and teach us. His name is James Hampson. He's the director of graduate admissions uh, at Biola University. And uh, he holds a Master of Arts degree in New Testament from Talbot School of Theology and a BA in English from Cal State Long Beach. Those guys. Uh, <laughs> Long Beach. I played baseball with Vincent and college. I was oh. Uh, before, before his work at Biola, James served on the mission field in Poland uh, doing youth work and sports ministry. James has a passion for bringing voice to those who have endured trauma uh, by sharing his own story and helping them find uh, their story in Jesus. So uh, let's let's welcome him. Yeah, thank you guys. Glad you're here. Thank you guys. You, you probably noticed in the introduction that nothing said psychology on it, right? There's no, I have no training in this area. So that's the first note. You came to a testimony, you didn't come to an expert. You came to someone who's lived it, but I don't have a PhD in psychology. I just get to work for a school that has a that is trained psychologist. So um, I'm also not going to recruit you to Biola, but if you want me to recruit you, I have an obligation as somebody who recruits for Biola to say, I will recruit you. I can do that. So, but we're going to talk about my story here. Um, yeah, welcome. Uh, just a quick note on the, the handout you have. <laughs> I want to say I probably overprepared and have too much information. So they asked me for a handout, and I said, well, I don't even know what I can ask everybody. So I gave you my outline, the general outline, and there's three questions there just to think about. On the back is for you to choose your own adventure afterwards if you want. There's some spiritual meditations that you can do. If you notice, I'm a, a New Testament major, but most of my stuff after college or after seminary was Old Testament. I really found my voice, my trauma journey in the Old Testament, actually. And I think it's a neglected area of the scripture. And you'll see that come out. So I want to say this is my journey. This is my story. It may not be your story. It may, it may be that you relate with part of it, and part of it you're like, what in the world is going on? Why would you connect that? This is my story, and I'm just here to witness to you guys about it and what Jesus has done. Amen, brother. All right. If I can get amens, I'm all for that. I'm going to give you guys a very depressing verse. We're going to start with this. By the way, this is my wife and me. There's a reason she's in front. That's just how our marriage works out. Yeah. And this is us in Egypt five years before we figured out how to marry each other. So life is a journey, lots of twists and turns, but I'm glad it worked out for us. So let me read this verse. And I would love to hear you guys' reaction to this verse. Not just a theological reaction, but an emotional reaction. This is Ecclesiastes 7, 13 to 14. I accidentally put 15 on the, the sheet, but you can get even more depressed with 15. So, <laughs> consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider. God has made one as well as the other. So that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Mm. What do you think? <laughs> what, what's, your, what's your reaction? What's your emotional reaction to that verse? The first thing I thought of was keep your eyes off, eyes off of others and, and just okay. on yourself because you're yeah. no one's going to know anything after you after Absolutely. you're Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it keeps you from looking at others. Yeah. Absolutely. What else? There's good and bad. Yeah. It kind of gives equal weight to both. There was, a, I think it was in the last, I was in this room for the, the last one I was scouting about. You know, about uh, the guy who was talking about suicide prevention. He's like, don't give him 820, Romans 828. For God works all things for the good. Like there, there's always, That's an ill time verse. Very true, right? <laughs> this doesn't feel like that, does it? Yeah. When I read this. Think of our political situation. Yeah. And how things have been really good for Americans in America. Yeah. And going into the future, it's really kind of uncertain. Yeah. Yeah, a crooked road could be coming. <laughs> There's a lot of crooked roads in the past. Maybe yeah. we're on a crooked road right now. Yeah. Life has both straight roads and crooked roads. And what this verse does for me is it pries my fingers open mm -hmm. for controlling my own life. Mm -hmm. 
one of the difficulties in my trauma journey was thinking that I was responsible for all of it. Mm -hmm. Right? God prize our hands open. That's why I love Ecclesiastes. Not because it's depressing, but it hits you over the head that you are not in control. Crooked ways and straight ways come. Often when we're in the crooked, we think, what did I do? How am I messing up? How can I make it straight? Maybe you just can't. So my trauma journey is, or my story that I'm going to tell you, is not a why. It's not a why did God do this, and then somehow later I figured out why he did it, and now I'm okay with it. Oh, it's actually a good thing, because God, God told me why. I think there's less whys in our journeys with suffering. I don't even know if I'll know why in heaven. I just need to know that God meets me in that journey. Yes. Okay? Consider God. That's what we're going to do. Consider God in our journeys. Okay. So why do we even talk about this? Why do we speak about trauma? It's in the air, right? A lot of people are speaking about it. Why do we do it? Well, I think trauma is an unseen prison. And why I speak about it is because I think there's probably people in this room, people that I'm friends with, that are trapped in this prison. People in our churches are trapped silently in this prison. You know what the number one predictor of trauma is? The role of social support. If you endure a traumatic event and you have negative social support, your trauma likelihood is going to go up like this. If you have positive social support, people who will come and hear your story, it actually goes way down. But this is our churches. From the inside, you're trapped. You're silenced. You feel silent. You're lo- alone and you're in shame because of your journey. But guess what? We also do that to our congregants. We silence them. We leave them alone. We talked about in the first session today about how individualistic we are. I think that's traumatizing. And we shame them for their journeys. There's a real prison in our midst, and we need to speak about it. Why do we speak? Because with witness, with telling your story, comes free. We break free by telling grieving and honoring our trauma stories. Everything in you, that story that you have that keeps invading your present, that you feel deep shame about, that you don't even want to think about ever again, ironically, you need to tell that story. And you need to know that God honors that story. And you need to find somebody that will honor that story with you. I didn't even know I had a story until somebody helped me to see it. I believe, just like we said in the first session, that the church needs to be a place of witness. Witness of trauma and healing. And there's a real reason I use this witness. I think it's actually a big theme in scripture. We read the Psalms, there's 150 of them, right? Mm -hmm. They tell stories all the time. They witness to journeys. And often they're a retelling of a story. And often they're retelling of a bad story or a sad story. Mm -hmm. How come we don't do that here? Why don't we witness to that? Why do we speak? It's what Jesus does. Jesus is in this business right here. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. This is Jesus' job. This is the type of God we serve. And yet we're content to simply pass the gospel on from a distance. Only talk about forgiveness of sins in heaven. There is freedom in Jesus as he meets us on the road to suffering. So just quick context. Some of you guys are experts, so you could probably uh, teach me on this. But these are some definitions that I've worked with. Uh, Judith Herman, I think, is an amazing writer. Um, Christine Cortad does work in uh, complex trauma. There's the DSM, and then an extra note. Notice the, the similarities here. Trauma events overwhelm you. These are overwhelming experiences. Right? They include uh, experiencing that experience. It could be witnessing that experience. You could be a witness to a tragedy. Or you could be listening to that experience. So as a witness of somebody's story, you also can have trauma symptoms as well. Most of that experience is fear, helplessness, and horror. 
Okay. I also want to add that part of your um, journey in trauma can also be your vantage point. So last year, uh, last year around this, well, last July, not this last July, it was July 4th, my wife and I were, in, and our kids were in a major car accident. I was driving down the 6th, actually just past that time for the, that place for the first time since that, that year on the way here. I was thinking a lot about it. I was driving, was going down the road, we had a great day at the, the Museum of Natural History at, in LA. And um, we were going, we hit the 60 off the 101, and uh, the traffic stopped. There's a curve there, you can't see well. We were kind of slamming the brakes on, and this guy just comes out of nowhere. Because mm -hmm. he was avoiding running and just smacks us. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to hit the side. So I, I'm controlling the car. My wife's screaming, my kids are screaming. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were fine. No injuries, lost soreness for the last year, but. I had no trauma symptoms from it. My wife had severe trauma symptoms from it. She was on the side of impact. Mm -hmm. I could feel the car. I knew within a second that I was not going to hit the center divide. I could feel the wheel. My wife had severe trauma symptoms, and my son had severe trauma symptoms. Nobody else did. They were on the side of impact. So it doesn't matter where you're at. So what this should do for us is help us not to judge trauma stories. They all depend on your own journey and where you're at, your own experience. We just need to listen and witness. There's a different sort of trauma. So that's general trauma. Uh, there's something called complex PTSD. Who's heard of complex PTSD? All right, okay, yeah, good. So this is Christine Kortoff. Complex trauma encompasses multiple and repeated experiences of interpersonal trauma, usually starting in childhood, often becoming chronic. So this is trauma over a long time. So if the car accident that we were involved in is like a flood, it hits in a second, this nails you, and you are overwhelmed. Chronic trauma or childhood trauma happens over time. It's like little raindrops that become a flood. This is a lifetime of trauma. This is the trauma that I, I is part of my brain. Excuse me, it's around a relational attachment, and there's usually an interchange between a hypervigilance, that means you're always on, you're always scared of something, you're always alert, so your body's sort of always lit up, and being disassociated. That's it, you feel like detached from the world, you feel out of it, you maybe feel like a shadow or not alive. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that felt for me. So you're watching for relational danger, and you're emotionally dead and detached from the self and the world. So you're, you're truly living a paradox, right? You're living both. Yeah. There's always danger, but you're always sort of like emotionally detached, not sure, you know, if you, sometimes you feel not, not alive. So here's some key complex. Uh, key aspects of the world of complex trauma. It really helped me to like look at this as a map. So somebody who has complex trauma, what does the world look like to them? If you've endured years and years of relational trauma, betrayal, how would you actually view the world? And I, I'm a Christian this whole time. I believe God made an ordered world. I believe it's fallen. I, so I have theological beliefs, but deep, deep beliefs, this is what we would maybe think about. So one, the world is dangerous and I'm abandoned to navigate it. So I'm a survivalist. This world is super dangerous, and I have to figure out how to navigate through it. The goal of relationships is not to be hurt. So any relationship, there's danger, right? I have to find a way not to be hurt. The world is upside down where protectors, those who are supposed to protect you, are actually the threats. You live in a cruel irony. I'm emotionally and relationally uh, disconnected from the outside world. So that's the disassociation. My world is hidden and locked away, and I actually hide myself in that world. So we'll talk a little bit later how there's two changes, and we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like. There are different parts of me I used to navigate. So again, a fragmented self, and then also deep, deep shame. You're ashamed of who you are, and uh, uh, not just what happened to you, but your actual <coughs> core being is deep, deep shame. It's not a fun world, is it? Mm -hmm. Some of our people are living that world. So I'll talk about my trauma map. Okay, so this is kind of what I was going through, and I would say, me meanwhile, I was having kids. I was going to seminary, had a happy marriage, or a good marriage, right? I was moving up in my job. I was handling a lot, but I was that inside. So this is that shattered self. So uh, for me, this journey was really about a shattering of who I was and who I am. 
So there was many Jameses. There was the James on the outside, maybe wear a suit, have a tie. James on the inside was a scared, broken child. In that time, we were going through, uh, we were actually, I'll tell us a little bit, I'll give you a sneak peek here. We were trying to go to the mission field to one of the most traumatizing areas in the world. That was a good idea. Uh, <laughs> that was but, a good idea. But <clears throat> praise the Lord, this mission organization was advanced and had us meet with a psychologist. And he told us that night we were at orientation. And the orientation you're supposed to go and they're supposed to tell you whether you're in or out. He said, you're not going to make it. Why did you meet us fly to Orlando? <laughs> you just got here. He says, I needed to see for myself because your testing showed the inside James. Wow. But your life, your outside was so different. It was, it was, even for him as a psychologist, it was like, this is weird. I need to see this for myself. So you're fragmented. You have a hidden internal world. There's great shame of my own shattered identity. And you fear like you're going to become like the perpetrator. You have a hard time differentiating uh, your own, their sin and your own responsibility. Okay. This is my Hebrew coming out here. Um, this is my favorite Hebrew word. It's not hesed, loving kindness. Yeah, that's mine. It's eka. And uh, three out of the five poems in Lamentation start with eka. Our, Hebrew, our English Bible is translated as a last or half. But it really is just a scream that what you're experiencing is so unspeakable that all you can do is scream. So as Jerusalem looks at her devastated state and lamentations, all she can do is say, a cup, a cup. So there's an uh, eternal voicelessness, voiceless scream of terror. For from those very first tra traumatic moments comes out a scream that I could not listen or hear. I'm sorry that this is so low. Can we, can we move that over? Yeah, is that, is that what's going on? There, there we go. Sorry. It's making you work out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what happens in this, and I didn't even know this, I was initially having it, it was just there. It's this, this, this deep, deep scream. Um, it's always present, but never voiced. It's unspeakable, so I couldn't give voice to it. I couldn't say, hey, I'm really sad about that. I just couldn't even face it. And this is a, a classic uh, trauma symptom. It's called re-experiencing, where the past invades the present. So you think about like a, maybe a, a combat veteran that was in a bombing, and a balloon pops, and then the whole war comes back. That's always coming in a complex trauma. It's maybe not such a direct line. It may be a feeling. It may be um, just simply a smell or a thought but it always comes back. It's always present. So a constricted world. So this is your world of potential. This is your world of complex trauma. You have to live in a constricted world because if reminders bring back the screen, the past, you have to find a way to avoid those reminders. So another big trauma symptom is avoidance. So you're avoiding relational danger, you're keeping people at arm's distance, you're avoiding memories of it, um, you're managing a very intricate world to not be heard again. And it's a very tiring world. Mm. So you're trying to avoid the pain of the trauma and relational danger. That's how I felt inside. I'm a pretty, like, even kill guy. This is how I look most of the time. This is my happy face. <laughs> this is my sad face, right? But that's how I felt. So this is, again, you see relational danger. Danger and catastrophe are everywhere. So when I go to, out to dinner with my wife, um, she, this is how she's on the road now. This is how I am at dinner. I see every relationship in there, and I can measure it. I can see the person that's about to fight with their wife, the person that's ignoring their kids, the kids about ready to act out, and it's all there, like just like the spider senses, right? It's always there. So you're always seeing potential catastrophe. You never want to go back to those unspeakable moments. And then when I started having kids, this is where it was really difficult. So overreaction of fear, especially with my kids. So I can remember a time I, I just desperately never wanted my kids to be hurt. That was always huge for me. And uh, I'm going to sound really cool about this. I was under the hood of my car, and I was trying to fix it. I can't fix cars. I don't even know why I was under the hood. But I don't know. I was trying to tighten something. Probably the flux capacitor or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. 
and my kids, I let we let all four, I, all four of our kids in the cars play, right? So I can, they don't be in the street and stuff. I get to see them, and they're wrestling. And our youngest has major heart issues. It's very fragile, and so I see them wrestling, and it's getting too rough. And I just see like she's about to get this hurt, and it probably wasn't even true, but I see the potential of catastrophe. I just lost it. You know, I had to apologize to my kids afterwards. Yeah. But you just explode because you just don't want to see pain again. By the way, you guys can ask me questions as long as I said that at the beginning. We'll try to save some time at the end, but you can interrupt me too if you have questions. Uh, this is my favorite Gustav Dory painting. Gustav Dory was a religious painter. He did this all in wood, and this is actually uh, from Isaiah 51. This is a literal known uh, theme in the Old Testament the God conquering chaos and evil, especially through the lens of Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And so I, for me, in my journey, and thinking of my uh, trauma through the lens of the Bible, uh, chaos has been a big <laughs> part of that journey. And this is sort of like uncreation. You know Genesis 1-2, where there's the deep, the darkness, and the deep, and the spirits there, but things aren't quite formed yet. This is what the world of emotion, emotional numbing looks like. So when we hear numbing and trauma, we think about like drinking alcohol, taking opiates, you know, maybe people cutting or trying to avoid. There's also this sort of dis like this like this dissociated state of being numb emotionally. And so to me, it's like living in that dark space. So if God were to take you all the way back to Genesis 1, 2, before he brings order, and he was to hold you over that deep dark and drop you and you're sinking and sinking. That's how this would feel. You're just in a haze. You feel in this emotionally numb place. So I couldn't really access my emotions, which was very hard for my wife, as you might want, uh, imagine. I'm just flat. Sometimes in this extreme uh, sort of journey is you, you really feel like the world's spinning, or things are melting away. You feel very dissociated. I remember giving, I, I teach a lot of my church, I gave him a talk, and then all of a sudden, boom, the world is spinning, and I'm having a panic attack while I'm speaking. And I asked my friend afterwards, like, how did it go? He said, yeah, you did fine. But I, internally, it was just spinning. I, I don't even remember what I said. So a lot of people who live with complex PTSD live with an inner deadness. They feel like a phantom or a shadow. There's lots of stories you can read on that, and if I have time, I'll read that. Go ahead. It, it isn't what we see in their lives, their flatness. Isn't that a part of their own survival? Yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. If I connect emotion, that can be hurt, right? Yeah. 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 But I don't know I'm doing that. I just I realize that a relationship is danger. Like deep down in my soul, I know that relationship is danger. So I uh, stay distant. Yeah. Right. And, and in fact, I don't think I could. Uh, I, if somebody told me, oh, you're, you're too distant. Can you be like happy sometimes? I, I just wouldn't know how to do that. You know, so you really can't access. So you're trying to this back to the prison analogy. You can't access those emotions. You haven't been taught to do those. So three witnesses. This is this is the change, the turn to a positive road. So I had three witnesses, and that's this the, most of the remainder of our time. We'll be talking about how God put witnesses in my, my journey to meet me in the midst of uh, this suffering. He didn't make it not suffering, but he met me. And that's what God does. So unexpected witnesses. All right. So uh, Talbot School of Theology has a spiritual formation focus in it, and they make you go up to do silent retreats. Isn't that cool? Yes. You hear about seminary as cemetery. I can see that happening, but they've done a great job. I'm not just selling it. I lived it. So we had this sign of retreat, and it's really hard to be quiet. Uh, but I was up, the, uh, up in the mountains by myself um, on a rock, just thinking about what was ahead in life. Didn't know I was traumatized, but just sad and praying and asking God to intervene in some things of our future. And I saw this sort of vision in the shadows. And I did a couple, double take, and it just spoke to me right away. James, you will walk a road of suffering. But I'm going to meet you and make you like that butterfly tree. So it was it was a grace to tell me ahead of time. I didn't know what that would be. I actually thought it would be with uh, some sickness in our family that's inherited. 
And so I thought, okay, it's, it's going to help me to serve my wife and my in-laws in their uh, journey of sickness. Well, that was 2009, and by the end of the semester, I was starting to get chronic pain. Uh, my arms started tingling, started getting uh, carpal tunnel, and uh, I've had chronic pain ever since. And everything, every, everything I would try it would increase. Now that I look back on it, the chronic pain was from my body being so tense. Years and years of just being like this, that was a witness. That was when my body was screaming, something's not right. Uh, and in that journey, you know, doctors don't really address this. So, oh, you know, here's some uh, medicine or here's some treatment, here's opiates. So that was a part of these for giving me opiates. I shouldn't have had opiates, right? Like, this is before we started realizing that. And I, I had to go through that journey as well. And then, um, like I said, we went to this mission uh, society. And they made us take the MMPI. I mean, who knows about the MMPI? Okay, that test is crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It's a very extensive, it's like 600, uh, yeah. 600 questions. It keeps asking you if somebody's watching you. By the end, you know you feel like somebody's watching. Somebody's I had to take it in seminary too, and they didn't tell me about it. So we get to this uh, uh, this missionary uh, orientation. I was saying, so we take the MMPI. My wife and I had traveled um, since two in the morning to get to Orlando. We get there, we we go right to this psychologist like, appointment, and we're thinking, yeah, I mean, we know we have issues, but we're we're ready to go. We're ready to go to this region that needs the gospel. And I could tell the psychologist was nervous. He's a Rosemead psychologist, so part of our school. And he was kind of east and Finally, he just plopped down the MMPI and said, James, uh, your MMPI says you should be committed. <laughs> He's like, wow. he, he was nervous to tell me that. He's, and, you know, I told you guys, uh, he wanted to see this, this, two, this duality that I was living. Uh-huh. Not on purpose to have two lives, but simply living in internal pain. And I just thought, as he said that, yes, thank you. Oh, Chrissy can hear. And I, had, I couldn't have told you I needed to be committed or I needed mental health help. I just knew I was just so much in pain. That was the first word from somebody else to say, you need help. And it was a blessing. Mm-hmm. Then he said, well, you guys aren't going to make it. And we said, what should we do? And they said, we well, should just fly home. I said, what? We're going to go into Disneyland instead. <laughs> we decided to stay. And they actually did admit us. So we had to talk to them about that afterwards. But they, they uh, required us to get, um, both of us to get counseling. It took three years to get into counseling because of um, just not finding the right person. But finally, we found an enduring witness. And this is my counselor who spoke last year at this retreat. Another vision that God gave me as I was entering my relationship of counseling was one of a dark, dark cave. And I knew that in my counseling, I was going to have to go to hell, my own hell. And Jesus' hand was on my shoulder, Hmm. saying that I will go with you. I will be with you. This is Dante's Inferno, if you guys ever read that in high school or had to read it. We had to make our own hells in high school. I had to make basketball hell. Uh, <laughs> but this was my personal hell. So this is a, a picture of Dante, and he has this, a guy named Virgil, who's his guide. And I think for most of us, we just need one person to say that I'm going to walk all the way down to hell with you. I'm going to be there for you. I'm not going to be judgmental. I'm not going to use those verses that we use as weapons. Yeah. I'm going to be with you. Yeah. So Dave was my Virgil, and God was working through him. This is uh, Dante saying, he, laid his, he, he had laid his hand on mine with cheerful countenance, strengthening my resolve. He led me to the secret things below. That's my journey. Somebody to lead me to my secret things. I can pass these slides on to you afterwards, too, guys, if you don't want to write too much. Oh, yes, I'll to write. <laughs> An enduring witness. Somebody who's going to walk years with you, a lifetime with you. That's what we need in our churches. Amen. That's what I need. So this enduring witness gave me two gifts, the gift of voice and the gift of grief. The gift of voice. He started witnessing to the truth. Now, I want to say what type of truth this is, because as evangelicals, 
most of us probably are evangelicals, uh, we often use truth as a weapon. This is compassionate witness to the truth. This is a gift of truth, not a weapon. Giving compassion and affirmation that I was not able to give myself. I had no context for my own self. So I remember, it was like one of our first uh, times together, I was just telling him about work and about some of the things I was doing with. And he said, that must be really tiring. And I went, yeah, that is tiring. I would not have been able to tell that to myself. It sounds so easy, right? But I was carrying all this, this stuff as I was doing it. And most of the time, I, I, people I would talk to at Biola and in other Christian circles would be like, we well, just kind of try harder. <laughs> or it's not that bad. Yeah. Like, they'll minimize it, right? Yeah. Well, then he had to start burning that map that I showed you guys before. He started having to inject himself into that map. So he injected reality as we talked about things of the past. He would say something like, he was a predator. He victimized you. That was cruel and unfair. And my internal internal uh, narrative was never that. I could not name those sins that I endured. Those were gifts of truth. The, the weapons we use are, well, maybe you sinned, or maybe you shouldn't have done this. Or maybe God's just trying to teach you something. Those are weapons. This is a gift, affirming our journeys. Yeah. But he also had to bring light to my control. Do you remember that narrow circle? That's a world of control. And one way I did it, I didn't realize this to, for a while. He didn't like say it outright. I actually came to the discovery through his direction. But I decided the best way to control my world was to be wrong about everything. Yeah. Everything. So if you could just be wrong, then you can control whether you could be right. Right? You could just be wrong. And actually, this is the temptation of uh, Job's friends to Job. Just repent. Just admit you're wrong. It'll be better. And there's Job's tempted to lie about his own journey. So I had to really start letting go. That's why Ecclesiastes is important to me. Why Job's important. I had to let go of controlling my world. And realize it's not all about me. It's not just my control of this world. People are, are mean. Some people are evil. Yeah. And sin really abounds. Gift of voice, accepting a new lens. Uh, it took about a year for Dave to tell me that he thought maybe I had PTSD. And I really appreciate that. You know, part of my journey as well as I went through and was just find, trying to find answers. I met with one psychologist before even I knew how much I was, I just knew I was just having problems. And within uh, two minutes, he said I had OCD. Two minutes, he evaluated me. This is a very prestigious psychologist. And I thought, I don't think I have OCD. My brother has OCD. I don't think I have OCD. But I was all of a sudden put in that camp. Uh, Christine Pertaw talks about in her book about uh, complex PTSD. People with complex PTSD have a history of being misdiagnosed. Oh, you have anxiety disorder. You have multiple personality disorder. Sometimes you have uh, your OCD. Or in our Christian circles, sometimes you're just not trusting enough. You're not faithful. You don't believe God is good. And so uh, he waited. And I really appreciated that patience. He wasn't there to figure me out. He was there to be with me. But once I heard it, it took me another year to accept it. And I came to a sobering sorrow. I had to come to terms with the reality that I suffered. I had to say, yes, I was abused. I was victimized. People didn't mean things to me. I was neglected. This is part of my journal here. I wrote, I was looking through it. This is a blessing to prepare because I have to look back at this. I got to say, my pain is real. My pain is valid. It's freeing to know to speak this language, but it has a certain sobering sorrow to it. It's like a deep sigh. A drooping of the arms. Has it really been that long? Has it been that hard? And that's that's God. And yes, it had been that long. And it had been that hard. So as I started to look through this new lens, I got to draw a new map, a new beginning. 
to understand how I move and who I am in this world. Who is really James? Yeah. I have to find that identity and affirm that. He also gave me the gift of grief. And I think this is a major challenge for our churches. I know for my family upbringing this is. I think a lot of people from my cultural background have a problem with the negative emotions. Uh, we think that anger is wrong. Uh, we think that sadness is wrong. And as soon as somebody is sad, we feel, we, either you feel shame for yourself or you feel, um, feel like somebody needs to move on. Like when somebody's angry around you, you want to fix it, right? You want to get them pushed to the next level. So what I experienced is I couldn't feel. Remember, I was emotionally numb. He started feeling for me. He started getting angry in the session. He started cussing a little bit. You know? And I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. He started exploring sadness and anger as positives. Like 40% of the Psalms are lament. There's anger in the Bible. There's a whole book about anger, lamentations. He started building a wider world up for me and actually uh, adding to my anemic theology. And this is, I had my seminary degree already and I was supposed to know all this stuff. <laughs> He explored my experiences of emotional numbness. He started to describe how I felt life like a shadow, a ghost. I was detached from the world. And we started describing it. I started writing narratives about it. Um, let's see, I do have one here. I didn't, wasn't ready to have this, this part of like, the, the way it's organized here, but I'll see. Yeah, so I'll, let me read this. And hopefully this gives you a window into what it felt like to be dissociated. So sometimes, some days, I feel restless unfocused, and I sort of float from one thing to another. I imagine a dark hotel hallway. The lights only uh, dimly work, for there is not life in the long, lonely walk. I can't see the end of this hallway, just blackness. The restlessness is forever. There are several doors that line each side of the corridor, all representing areas of engagement. The opportunity, opportunity where I can engage a life in a living way, and yet deep down inside, I know that these are always locked to me. At least that's what it feels like. I can't even bring myself to wiggle the doorknob. To engage it is, is pain. To go in is too much. So I walk this sort of, oops. Uh, so I walk this sort of nothingness with life all around me, but I am shut out from it. I just float, detached from my body detached from my body and also detached from myself. Deep down, I feel abandoned alone. Behind emotional numbing for complex PTSD survivors is usually abandonment. That's that core bottom. And describing this, this feeling allows, allowed me to get to that bottom. And actually, if I were to read the rest of my journal, um, angering actually allows you to get out of it. You start to practice the emotion. You start to separate yourself and come alive again through that anger and journey. So here's practicing anger. I just want to talk a little bit about the validity of anger. Um, and anger feels like a precarious road. It is a precarious road. And, and I think we're right to feel a little bit nervous about it, but we're more right to embrace it and to walk that road. Point one. You know what? We should be angry at sin and evil. If we would open our eyes and really look like God looks at this world, we would see sin and evil. The world is ordered. I know God created it as order. The chaos has admitted. And if you take some time to look across the world, or even just in your own heart or your own family, we have been infected by sin and evil, and it should make us angry because it's not right. Practicing anger acknowledges what is already there. I was talking to a, a friend uh, this last week who's going through a difficult time, and she just felt so much shame about being angry. She was scared of hating. And uh, we're hoping that she could practice that anger uh, to come out on the other side, not in hate, but actually what comes on the other side is hope. If we deny anger, we deny a large percentage of scripture, about 40% of the Psalms and a whole book of the Bible. And a lot of Jesus' actions. And we fear the anger cliff. So this is what, I, what I've experienced as I talk to people about anger, about anger, and this is what I experienced as I've dealt with anger. We feel like if we anger, we're going to be trapped in anger. 
that will drop out of the cliff and will move into bitterness and hatred. If you read a lament psalm that starts in anger, all of them except for two end in hope and prayer. I'll read a part of Lamentations a little bit later. And he has to anger to get to that famous verse. Mm. I don't think he gets the famous verse about, about faithfulness and steadfast love without angering first. Anger is a path. It's not a place. Right. It becomes a place when you actually live and stuff it down in that bitterness. So anger is meant to be expended. So as you experience that path, actually, if you test it, I think you'll, you'll find that it, it, it moves you out. So I had, to, I had to anger about family members a little bit, and I was really worried that I would hate them. I have a great relationship with them. And that's, I know that's not always possible, but angering allowed me to separate myself from their sin. It would also allow me to look on them with compassion, because I was able to expend what was inside. So anger allows you to tell the truth about your emotions and the sins you experience. Anger drives you out of emotionless detachment. It's a way out. Anger ironically builds separation and then compassion. That's been my experience, and I've seen others uh, enjoy it as well, and I've seen it in the scriptures. So the gift of grief, practicing lament. I just introduced this quick. You can have the slide here. This is a form of lament. Again, 40% of the psalms are laments. We don't sing about them in church at all, and they're such a blessing. This was a, a beginning of a lament I, I wrote to God. Is it your way to bring loss, to strip all we hold onto you for safety and control, to strip it, to strip it all away, to crush us, and then meet us in that loss and give us fully you? Does God do that? That's worth asking him about. So a lament is a sort of complaint. Something's not right with what I'm experiencing. And God, I want to tell you about it with my emotions. You see the, the flow here, address to God, review his faithfulness often, complaint, confession of sin, request for help, God's response, God of praise. This makes it look like you're going to promise despite your anger. I actually think you run into that. You hit it on the road of lament. Well, that has been a great gift of mine. And the final gift of grief, journeying into the depths of my story. So this was the big process that we went through. We got to tell the story, feel it, honor it, acknowledge its pain. We had to grieve and accept uh, my brokenness. We had to grieve the absence of help. That was a big part for me. Like, God, why didn't you show up these times? I'm grateful you did, but why didn't you show up then? I had to grieve that. I had to ask myself and God about family members who weren't around. I remember the day I actually reached bottom, the memory that was the bottom of this pain. You know how Dante has all those, those levels of hell? I remember that day. I know exactly what it looks like. And that was helpful for me to get there and go, oh, I see where the shattering started. And it became a symbol for me to know that there's a reason for this. There was a foundation stone that the rest of the childhood built off of. This was even hard for me to write for this. So I just want to tell you that. I still struggle with this. But I have a survivor identity. I remember our last session, they would say, you're a survivor. I felt, am I worthy to be a survivor? Was my trauma as bad as that trauma? No. That's why it's a little larger in text. Survivor. Survivor. And you who have gone through trauma, who are navigating this world, are survivors. Yeah. That should be a badge of God meeting you in your story and saying, I value your journey. You are a survivor. So the last witness, and this is actually this, uh, another enduring witness that I have. And I'll admit that I'm a Bible nerd. So this is how I process through it. But um, back further up, there's a, uh, I didn't mention this, but there's a sort of arc to trauma therapy. And uh, part of it's grieving your story. It's connecting back to your relationships. But the last one, at least to Judith Herman, is commonality. And that usually means finding other survivors, group therapy, and so forth, which is super valuable. Um, and I've found that. But for me, commonality in scripture was so important. 
I need to know that I'm in a line of faithful saints that were also survivors. And uh, I needed to wrestle with my own theology about what suffering looked like in the Bible. So I was a New Testament major. Praise the Lord, I got to take Hebrew too, because then I got to dive deep into the Old Testament. So most of my time has been in the Old Testament afterwards. So the gift of commonality, this is what it is, what it is not. Not going to scripture to avoid my pain, to downplay it, or to express my pain. Uh, which most people do. Most people do, yes. And usually it's just like a verse, right? Um, we silence the reality of our soul before God when we ignore our pain. And I guarantee, if you look far enough and meditate on scripture, you will find your pain. And I love that the Bible is full of pain because it reflects the reality of this world. Find it, so what it is, it's finding my story and voice in scripture, communing with the traumatized in scripture, meeting with Jesus along the road of suffering. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you, uh, I'll try to end quickly because I, I wanted to be able to talk questions, but here are uh, some precious, precious verses for me. And I gave you an outline, and they're on the back. I changed them a little bit to sort of broaden them. But uh, I tell you, uh, Lamentations became my favorite book. Yeah. And I tell people that, and they look at me cross-eyed. Like, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read a little bit of Lamentations 3. This is Jeremiah, the guy who had to preach judgment to Jerusalem, and then to see it happen. If he was, okay, I'm going to be just blunt. If he was some evangelical pastors, or just some Christian pastors throughout America and other parts of the world, he would have just said in Lamentations. Lamentations would have been short. It would have been, I told you so. <laughs> right? Right. It doesn't say that, right? In fact, Jeremiah journeys through Lamentations, and he's, he, his ministry changes. It becomes from a ministry of proclamation, which was needed. Israel needed to know their sin, that God's judgment was coming. But it changes into a ministry of presence. And in, in uh, Lamentations 3, it's very confusing for a lot of scholars because they don't know who it is. I think it's Jeremiah because it sounds so much like Jerusalem. It's like Jeremiah's identity in Jerusalem starts getting mixed up. And Jeremiah has entered the pain of his people. Yeah. He's been present with them. And he actually gets to express his own pain. So I remember the first time I read this with anger. I don't know if I'll do it here, but I'll read parts of it here. And I want to ask you a question. Can you relate to this, and can you say this to God? I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven me and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. Down to verse 7. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy, though I call and cry for help. He shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stone. He has made my past crooked. He even goes on to say in the next verse that God is a bear lying in wait for him, a lying in hiding. He has turned aside my steps and tore me into pieces. Mm. He has made me desolate. He keeps going, he keeps going. And you get down to uh, uh, 16. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. So I say that my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. That is only two verses until he says he has hope. This is anger expended. This is the end of the anger. And he says, remember my affliction and my wandering. The warm wood and gall, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I hope in him. I we going to Yes. You've got to say it. I, I never read that verse alone anymore. No, 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 no. This is the path, and this helped me so much. Oh, I got 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Lamentations became my baby. Habakkuk 3, dreading the future. I'll just say this really quick. This has helped me in catastrophizing, so everything looks bleak for the future. And I will say, just transparently, my family has some difficult things happening in the future, some the disease. And this has helped me to process through that. 
So we like to go to the end of Habakkuk, where he's got all the strength. But he has a road to that strength. First, he recalls the work of the Lord. And there's a, there's a theme in Scripture. I call it the old God theme. Can you those reasons for there? And uh, where people actually look back and go, remember what God used to like to save people and stuff? The prophets later talk about it. So uh, uh, Habakkuk 3.2 used to save us. Oh, Lord, I heard the report of you, so I heard about you. Uh, I heard your work, and I fear your work. In the midst of my years, or the years, revive that work. In the midst of the years, make it, rum, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God, will you do something about this? Will you invade this space? I remember what you used to be. Can you be that now? I think we need to pray that. And then he imagines God walk, uh, marching across the desert and uh, uh, saving and uh, uh, getting Babylon. And then um, in verse 16, he describes how his body's feeling. I hear my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones, my legs tremble beneath me. And then later in verse 17, you have though the fig tree, though everything go bad, right? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes my, me tread on high places. God is your strength. But he lets you journey to that strength. Job 3. I think Job, this is the, the chapter where Job curses the day of his birth. I think Job is really cursing a world that he didn't think would be possible. He thought that if I was righteous enough, I should not suffer. His friends did too, and reinforced that. But he realized that bad things can happen to good people. Yeah. So he says, I don't want to live in this world. I'd rather live in chaos. Or I'd rather live in the world of the dead. My world is shattered and is a place where bitterness and fear reign. That describes how I feel. And I just thank the Lord that I can find somebody else that feels that way. Amen. And I can talk to anybody after this about this, but I think part of our uh, connection with Jesus and our faith tends to be as an object. He's as object. He's the object I put my faith in, saves, my, saves me from my sins, I go to heaven, all true. But Jesus is also a subject in our faith. He walks with us in faith. And so I practice things where I walk down the path that Jesus walked. So in Luke 9.51, in, in this part of Luke, there's a point where Jesus turns his face to Jerusalem and the rest of Luke is this death march yeah. to that moment. So I want to walk with him. So I walk with him to the garden. I meet with him in his tears and his distress, his dread, and his faith. I see his forsakenness, and I think about my forsakenness through Psalm 22. And then I dwell with him on Saturday for a bit. We all rush to Sunday. Sunday is the joyous time. The Saturday is just as important. And this comes from a book by a lady named Shelley Rambo. It's a, it's a trauma book, trauma and a theology book. And she is calling the church to have Saturday as a celebration day, too, for the traumatized. Because we live between life and death. And we need to sit in Saturday for a while before we get pushed to Sunday. Doesn't mean we don't go to Sunday. We need to live there. Psalm 88 is the only uh, uh, lament psalm, one of the only lament psalms that ends in darkness. That's a good Saturday psalm. Lastly, I find witness and commonality. And I'll close with this, this verse. This is Paul. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power, that surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Ever thought about what that ministry is? Kind of weird. So that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given to death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. I think there's a ministry for those who've gone through suffering to carry some of the death they've experienced publicly. With wisdom, at the right time, with the right people. This is my moment. I carry some death. I carry it and I open it up to others at the right time so they may have fellowship in that time.
and I might lead them to the life of Jesus. So that's my purpose. Thank you guys for hearing my story. Big thank you. Any questions that we might have in the last five, uh, five minutes? We appreciate it. Uh, two daughters, two sons. Yeah, one has a heart issue. Yeah, the, my fourth, my my fourth kid, my second daughter. Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. curious what that was. It's called Schoen's disease. Oh. Okay. It's got four uh, issues with the heart: a hole in the heart, a coarct aorta, which is pinched, a bicuspic valve, which means you, in your aorta you're supposed to have three valves that open and close. It's two, okay. and then also um, her mitral valve is the form. She's had three angioplasties. Oh. And we're waiting for heart surgery. But if you saw this little six year old, she'd be running around like she looked fine. But we went through a pretty hard time during this time, uh, feeding her through to watching her die at times or close to death. And um, so it was that was part of that journey as well. Thanks for asking. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, you're dismissed. If you have any other, oh, go ahead. How'd your wife deal with all of this? Oh. Yeah, that's, she was at a loss for a lot of times. You think about the spouse that has to go walk in this journey. Um, you know, imagine having a husband that's detached, emotionally dead. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I was not engaged, but I, could, I, I was not engaged emotionally. And that was very difficult for her. And she also was at a loss at how to help me. She didn't have any contacts. So um, it was very difficult. It, it, honestly, it, it helped. So this sounds weird, but... Um, the car accident last year brought us to better understanding of each other's suffering because she got to experience a little bit of what trauma's like. I wouldn't have wished it upon her, but she got to see, oh, I see now. Um, and then as I started to be able to explain it and express it, she started to be able to grab onto it as well. Yeah, but yeah, it's a drain for the whole family. I'm sure my kids were affected, even though they were young in some ways. And we're very open as a family about trauma and, and sin and evil and, and suffering. Yeah. So that's helped us. My kids have all heard Joe front to back, so, and they picked it too, so. They have big hearts. Yeah, yeah, it's so large their hearts as well. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Great. Thank you guys, so glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.